back in ETV. Hi, I'm Melissa Montgomery from Balcony TV. This is John Hammond, lovely John Hammond, with a Hammond organ, about to play us a song called Late Rent. So you were telling me a little bit about that you had a story behind the, the song. Yeah, you know, um, of course, I don't have my band with me here right now, but uh, you can tell probably it's a shuffle, you know, and I recorded it with a, one of the great uh, studio drummers, a good friend of ours, Stephen Ferroni, who's the drummer and now in uh, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, you know. And uh, Steve just laid down a beautiful shuffle, and my music teacher from Berklee College of Music, Todd Anderson was on tenor saxophone and my uh, guitarist for a long time at that time. We, we recorded it in 1983. So what, what happened was I took my rent money because I had been producing my guitarist and I realized I had my own music to record and it got to be so costly, everything, the, the whole thing. So many musicians know the know the drill you know you record the music and then you got to get out there and 
pound the pavement. You know, in the old days before we had the internet, we literally had to go and knock on the doors of these record companies and take the people from the record companies out to lunch and give them recordings and press packs, you know, and keep calling them up, you know, and I, I had my overhead expenses in, in New York and, you know, so I realized that I had to do my own music and I, I took the, the last of the bank account and I said, I'm going to record my own tunes and I went into the studio where John Lennon had done his last recording sessions, the Intergalactic Studios in Manhattan, and I paid the cats and I paid the studio and then the next day I realized I didn't have the rent anymore. So I called up my landlord, Mr. Labarsky, you know, and I said, Mr. Labarsky, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but I spent the money on a recording session, you know, and um, it's going to be a little bit late. Oh, <laughs> yeah, so he said, well, we've known you a long time, Mr. Hammond. So, you know, when you get it together, give it to us in pieces and that's what we did and in good faith I gave him the master recording in those days we used two inch Ampex tape and big heavy box you know I brought it over to him and I said here's the master tape and you can hang on to it when I got the dough I gave him the dough he gave me the recording and then we yeah. put it out on our cable TV show and so it just earned its name you know late rent and that melody has just, you know, been with me. It's been theme song for my cable TV show for 30 years. In Manhattan, right? Yeah, in Manhattan, right. Manhattan Neighborhood Network. It's streaming all over the world. And then I did uh, four years every day on CBS radio with the Hammond cast show. And we used the same song for the opening for that and the, and the outro, you know. So it's been, been, been around the block a few times. <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit uh, about... Hammond and and when yeah. that's the history of it. Melissa, uh, this organ, it came about in a long way around, starting in 1934. The very first commercially released uh, Hammond Model A it was called, and that looked very similar to the one that everybody knows from the big rock bands like Santana and they they all Rolling Stones and all these guys. They tour with the big wooden one called a B3. The A, the Model A was the very first one, came out in 1934, Lawrence Hammond, and he also invented the tickless clock, you know? So he actually used the motors of the tickless clock to make the special sound that the Hammond organ makes. That's why no other people could make this sound, because he, he patented, he had 90 different patents, and he designed this system that used electromechanical tone wheels. And so the motor that did the clocks, that's what he used to design these electromechanical tone wheels. So actually when you started up the old organ, there were two switches up here. And the one was the start motor. And it's just like starting up an old car because it would crank the wheels with a very low gear, you know? And then once they'd start getting up to speed, you actually, had to hold it for a slow count of eight. And then once it got up to speed, then you hit the, the other switch that said run, and you held both switches. See, a lot of people don't know how to start them up right. Then you could mess up your organ. So you hold it for a slow count of eight, then you hold both switches for a slow count of four, then you let go of the start one, and then it's running. And then it's got these motors running around in there. I always say, to my girlfriend, I said, that, that's the chipmunks running around in there. Oh. And, the, and the harder I push on the keys, the faster the chipmunks run, you know? So they, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, so like that, that created a really unique way of, of creating the tone. And it had, it wasn't like a perfect solid tone. It has some, some you know, some very ironic kind of things that did, you know, but it's really a soulful sound. And that's why it became very popular in the Baptist churches, you know. And all the gospel players love to have the Hammond organ. So every gospel uh, congregation has a, a Hammond organ, you know. Wow. And you said, what was the year that yeah. that came? Well, the very first ones came out in 1934, you know. And then they modernized wow. them in the 50s. And in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, they were quite popular. But then, um, you know, things were all getting transistorized. 
And so what happened was uh, the company went through hard times and it, it went through bankruptcies and it got bought a couple of times. And finally in 1991, uh, Mr. Suzuki in Hamamatsu, Japan, he rescued the company and he decided he was going to keep the legacy going. But they, they, to manufacture these old beasts the way they used to do it with these electromechanical tone wheels, it was too expensive to do it. The, everything was made by hand, you know, hand wired. And so everybody was trying to recreate things digitally at, at one point. And the very first really big time a uh, keyboard uh, synthesizer that came out that could recreate everything from dog barks to uh, violin uh, uh, string sections from an orchestra. It was called a synclavier, you know? And the, and the basic synclavier cost a quarter of a million dollars. Oh, wow. And you could recreate any sound perfectly, but for some reason, they couldn't recreate the sound of a Hammond okay. organ the way it was. That's the with the emotional feel that the organ had. Yeah. So Mr. That's Suzuki beautiful. assigned his engineers to, to research and develop how to do it. And a lot of companies came out with different things that they could, the, instead of tone wheels, a lot of the companies, they would call them clone wheels, right? Mm -hmm. But when Hammond came out in late 91 with the very first portable one, it's called the XB2. And I got one of the first 10 pieces then the president and part owner of the company was Glenn Derringer, who was one of my heroes. He was a big star of the Mickey Mouse Club TV show, oh, wow. champion That's organ player. Oh, wow. And he called me up one day and he brought a prototype to New York. I didn't know exactly why he was calling me. He said, I'm in the Sheraton Hotel. Can you get over here real quick? And I said, Glenn, I'll be right over. I jumped on my bicycle and I ran over to the Sheraton Hotel. I, came into this hotel suite and he had this big thing under a, a sheet or a blanket, you know, and he said, are you ready? And I said, I think I'm ready. <laughs> so he said, okay, here it is. And then he, he pulled wow. the sheet off, you know, and there was the XB2 mm -hmm. and a Leslie speaker. Leslie speaker is about this big with rotating wow. horns. It, it give the Doppler effect. You know, yeah. when you're standing at the train mm -hmm. tracks and the train goes by, that's called the Doppler effect. Yeah. The sound is shifting, see? Mm -hmm. So that's what Leslie Speakers did. That's so he said, this is the XB2. They just finished developing it. We want you to try it. He showed me a few of the controls. He said, play it for a while because I got to go make some phone calls, you know? So then I played it for about 15 or 20 minutes. And then he came back in the room. He said, John, what do you think, you know? I said, man, I love it. <laughs> so he said, well, I'm glad you love it because this one's yours, you know. Oh, I said, yeah. whoa, all right, you know. Nice. And then I took it to Germany and, I, and, and it was, let's see, that one weighed about 30 pounds, you know. Oh, wow. And uh, they gave me a case. We didn't have a road case for it, so they gave me this lightweight case. Yeah. And they said, this isn't really a flight case. We're gonna, we call this case, this temporary case, we call it the Weekend Warrior, right? Okay. I said, well, I'm going to take the weekend warrior out for a long weekend. You know? <laughs> and I flew to Frankfurt, Germany with it. I didn't come back in the USA for a good year. And the case was come apart. I just tape it up, put stickers all over it. And that case, I still have that weekend warrior case, you know, and oh that gosh. organ went around the world with me all over the place. Since then, the XB2, the, the, X, the XK1 came out, the XK3, the XK3C. And then this new series, the SK series, yeah. this thing weighs 15 pounds <laughs> and just a hair <laughs> over 50. I mean, look at this, it's just so yeah. light. I love but they it. They really recreated the yeah. sound. And this is one of the unique things about these draw bars. See, these are nine different, mm -hmm. yeah. nine different harmonics. See, there's the that's that's a percussion sound. See, these are the high ones. When you pull it all out, it's real brassy. Shape the sound, see? Yeah. And then here's the digital Leslie. Oh, yeah. And this is the vibrato scale. Sounds it's like... Just, just a single tone. Back in ETV! <laughs>